Thanks everyone for joining our very first seminar of the semester. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Nils. He's a professor in the Institute Dennis Poisson at University of Orleans, France. His research focuses on mathematical physics, dynamical systems, in particular perturbation theory and stochastic differential equations. So today he will share some of the related work about theory and applications of random Poincaré maps. So Neil, feel free to get started. Okay, so thanks, Ying. Thanks to all the organizers for the kind invitation. So I'm very <coughs> happy for this opportunity to talk at Brandeis University. So it's the first time, even though it's uh, <coughs> a remote talk, it's good in these uh, somewhat difficult times we have the technology to keep interacting. And I'm going to try to make the talk a little bit more interactive by <coughs> Uh, using my tablet uh, during the talk. So what I'm going to tell you today is based on mainly on joint works with two former PhD students of mine. So uh, Manon Boudel and uh, Damien Landon. And there will be some work I will mention with other collaborators. I will give you names at the end. So <clears throat> here's my uh, the outline of my talk today. So I will start by defining what I actually mean by random Poincaré maps. And then I will spend quite some time on a particular application, which is the analysis of uh, oscillation patterns of the stochastic Fitzhugh-Nagumo model, which was one of the motivating examples that uh, started me thinking about these uh, random Poincaré maps. Then I, I want to give an outline of another aspect of the theory, which is the spectral theory, before uh, talking a little bit about uh, ideas for future research. So uh, let me start with uh, what I mean by Poincaré map. You may know it as return map. So it's uh, the following idea. So you, let's say we have an ODE of the form x dot with f of x. And uh, X is uh, state space is say Rn. And uh, so this ODE comes with a flow. So that's the map which is giving the solution at time t as a function of the initial condition. And let's assume I uh, have a surface or a piece of a plane which is transverse to, to the flow. And then what I can do is I start at some point X on, uh, on the surface and I wait until the flow brings me back to the surface and uh, can be a different point or the same point. And I, I call this uh, <coughs> the image of X under the Poincaré map. So my Poincaré map will be a map, let's call it pi going from sigma or maybe a subset of sigma to sigma. And it maps a point X on the surface to pi tau of X where tau is the return time. So it's the first time <clears throat> strictly positive time such that pi T of X is again in sigma. So if you've worked with ODE, you've probably encountered this and you know that it has uh, many uses. So let me mention a few. So one is simply visualization because I have a, a <clears throat> one dimension less. So for instance, if N is three, uh, I have a three dimensional flow, but I have a two dimensional map, which is easier to, to visualize. But perhaps more importantly, uh, it allows to uh, analyze periodic orbits and in particular stability of periodic orbits. And so a periodic orbit, let me <coughs> denote this PO, a periodic orbit will be a fixed point of the map. And uh, for instance, if you want to analyze stability, what you can do is you can linearize and then you have, uh, you, you have a periodic linear system. So you do Floquet theory and then there's always this uh, uh, neutral direction you have to get rid of if you 
for instance, want to show your orbit is stable. Maybe you want to use a Lyapunov function or something. But if you do it on the level of the map, you just have, uh, you don't see this neutral direction at all. So it makes uh, things a little bit simpler. And in the same spirit, you can also uh, do a bifurcation theory. So because your Poincaré map is, is more local than, uh, than the real dynamics of the periodic orbit, you can easily classify possible bifurcations. So you find that there are bifurcations like set a node and period doubling and so on, just by looking, by applying normal form theory to this map. So now it's, it's rather uh, natural to ask the same question for a uh, stochastic differential equation. So I will be interested in stochastic differential equations of the following form. So dxt is some drift term f of xt dt plus some noise term sigma g of xt dwt. So wt is a, is a Wiener process and Often I will think of sigma as being a small parameter, though it doesn't have to be in, in all cases. So X is still in Rn, W can be in some Rk, and then G will be a matrix of the appropriate size. So I don't know if, if you're all familiar with FDE, uh, with uh, stochastic differential equations. So if, if you're not, a simple way of uh, thinking about it is, uh, in terms of a uh, Neuler scheme. So um, if, if you uh, uh, sorry, I'm just just have a problem with my tablet. So let's see. Okay, I think it's so Euler scheme would be you choose a small time step delta t, and then you would say that x at time t plus delta t is uh, approximated by x at time t plus f of x t times delta t. So that would be for the ODE. Now for the SDE, you would add another term, which would be sigma g of x t times square root of delta t times a uh, some uh, z, which is uh, a random variable, which is normally distributed with uh, mean zero and, uh, and variance one. So you add random increments at each time step with, uh, with some scale. Now, uh, the, nat the natural thing to do is like you see on the picture. So assume I have uh, say two stable periodic orbits, which are gamma one, gamma two maybe an unstable periodic orbit between them. And I have my uh, surface sigma. So I start somewhere uh, at some point x naught. And then I, I want to say that x1 is uh, actually the image of x naught under uh, the flow. So <clears throat> which is now a random thing. And after a, a random time tau. Now there, there's a small problem here, which is not uh, very difficult to solve, but uh, one has to be aware of it. It's if I define the return time as before, so uh, the first time at, at which uh, phi t of x of x naught is in sigma, this will actually be zero. That's because, all right, so <clears throat> I was saying that if I just define the uh, return time to sigma is before, this is not going to work because uh, this time is actually equal to zero. And uh, but there, there's a, an easy solution to that problem. So a possibility is that I introduce a second section sigma prime, and then I just insist that I hit sigma prime before going back to sigma. So what I can do is I, <clears throat> I introduce tau prime, which is the first hitting time of uh, the section sigma prime. 
and and then I say that tau is actually the first time t bigger than tau prime such that xt is again in sigma, and then <clears throat> I take this uh, this uh, as a return time, and I define the the image of x naught as a phi tau of x naught tau for this term. So. What I have now is, is actually, uh, it's a Markov chain. So it's a Markov chain which maps a probability distribution into another probability distribution. So if X naught, okay, it can be deterministic, it can have a probability distribution, but X one, in any case, will be a random variable. And so it maps X not to the random variable x1 and which will then be mapped to x2 and so on. So that's uh, the basic idea. So just a word on, on literature. So I didn't invent this uh, concept, but uh, the oldest reference I, I know where this idea uh, is being used is by, by Weiss and, uh, and Knobloch in the 90s. Okay, which <clears throat> really did some some basic uh, arguments about about these maps, but it, it uh, considered these maps, and there are a couple of papers by Pavel Hitchenko and uh, Georgi Medvedev. So from uh, there's one from 2009 and the other from 2013 where they really use the term point uh, carré map of randomly uh, perturbed periodic motion. So uh, so that's one of the references that uh, inspired me to to look at these things more closely. So uh, I, I was saying that I have a Markov chain. So <clears throat> maybe you're all familiar with Markov chains, maybe not. So let me just fix the, the notation. So what you're more likely to have seen is uh, the discrete case. So the discrete case is say I have a, a set, let's say just a finite set for simplicity, one to N, and I'm given uh, transition probabilities. So PXY will be a the transition probability in one step. So that would be the probability that xn plus one is equal to y given that xn is equal to x. And uh, so these uh, transition probabilities I can put in a stochastic matrix. And I use the mathematician's convention, which is that the row is the starting point and the column is the arrival point. So I write it as this, P1, Pn, Pn1, Pnn. So the, PI, the Pxy are non-negative numbers and the rows are sum to one. And then the typical notation I'm gonna use is I will write the initial condition as a superscript. So px x1 is equal to y. So that would be a probability x1 being equal to y given that x0 is equal to x. So that's just pxy. But I can also start with a more general initial distribution, mu. And then I can write things like probability when starting in mu that x1 is, uh, is equal to y. And that will be given by the sum over all x in my state space of mu of x pxy, which is nothing but uh, mu times p component y, so mu is uh, mu as a row vector, p is a matrix. And I can also look at observables. So if f is a function from x to r, so what would be called an observable in physics, then I can look at the expectation starting in mu of f at time one, and that will now be given by a double sum and so I will have mu of x 
Txy and f of y. And this uh, I can also see as just the row vector mu times the matrix P times the column vector f, which is in here. All right, so here we have uh, something quite similar, except that it is in continuous space. So my space is now sigma. And uh, instead of transition probabilities, I have a transition kernel. So it's some function k of x, y, which is a probability density kernel. And I can look at things like probability starting at x that at time one, I will be in some subset A of, uh, of my sigma. So this is given by the integral over A k of x, y, dy. And <clears throat> that is also often denoted by k of x, y, x, a. And similarly, I can look at expectations. So starting with uh, some initial distribution mu of my observable at time one, and that would now be given by a double integral over sigma of mu of x, k of x, y, f of y, dx, dy. And this I can also write in short form as mu k f. So the important thing here is that my, my k, my kernel k, uh, gives me a linear operator, which has nice properties, uh, especially uh, if my functions f and g and my sigma are reasonably nice. I, I will have a smooth density and uh, my operator k as linear operator is compact. So it has a, a many nice, many desir desirable all right, so let me turn now to uh, to my main example, which is the stochastic uh, Fitzhugh-Nagumo equation. So as I, my understanding is many of you uh, work on things related to neuroscience, you probably know this model. So it's a simple toy model, which, uh, okay, it's a simplification of models like Hodgkin-Huxley. And it's a, Quite simple model, but which uh, achieves to reproduce uh, behavior like spiking of neurons. So I have two variables. X uh, measures the membrane potential of the neuron. Y, the recovery variable, is related to the proportion of open ion channels. So I have two uh, state variables. I have three parameters, A, B, and epsilon. Epsilon is time scale separation. So just for simplicity, let me assume that B is zero because then I have a, a single equilibrium point, P, which is given by A and uh, A cubed minus A, which on my picture is uh, down here. That's my point P. And you can do a stability analysis and you uh, find that actually everything is easily expressed in terms of this bifurcation parameter delta here. And so uh, P is a focus if and only if delta is smaller than, uh, than epsilon, absolute value, and it is stable if uh, delta is, uh, is strictly positive. So here's my, here are some orbits in the phase space. So, so here I have X and Y. Uh, this is the null Klein X dot equals zero. And the dotted uh, line here is the null Klein Y dot equals zero. So I have plotted a few orbits. The red one is just a particular orbit which kind of separates uh, spiking and non-spiking motions. And you, you have this behavior here, so delta is positive, so P is stable. So you may, depending on where you start, you may make a big excursion, but then you just uh, go to, uh, to the stable point P and then you remain there. But what's interesting about this model is that if delta is positive but small, this uh, system is what we call excitable. 
which means that small per perturbations can bring you from uh, your stable point P on the other side of this uh, separate trix, and then you have a big excursion corresponding to a spot. Okay, now uh, I can do the same with noise. So let me now add uh, some uh, stochastic terms here. So sigma one over square root epsilon dWt one and sigma two dWt two. So these are independent uh, Wiener processes and the square root of epsilon I put there because the uh, variance of my noise term will grow like uh, sigma one squared over epsilon times T. So by putting the square root of epsilon, it becomes comparable to the, to the drift term, which is in one over epsilon. So it's a convenient scale. So now here I, I've plotted a, a solution. So starting here, I, I go to a neighborhood of my, my stable point, my deterministic stable point. And then I do uh, a number of small oscillations. And after a certain number of oscillations, I, I get kicked out and uh, there's a spike and then I return and uh, I keep doing that. So I can also show you a few uh, time series here. So this is uh, X or minus XT as a function of T. So what I've done here is that I have fixed epsilon and delta at the small but uh, positive value. And from one plot to the next, I increase the noise intensity. So what you see is that you, you have these spikes and <clears throat> the interval. So what I, I'm interested in is this inter-spike interval is random. So the larger the noise, the more frequent the spikes become. And another thing you can notice is that the shape of the spikes uh, is pretty much the same every time. But if you look at what happens here at, uh, at small scales, you have uh, small oscillations, which correspond to these small rotations around, uh, around P. And their number is random, and that varies a lot between uh, different spikes and also their amplitude is pretty random. So that tells you that at least in this particular regime, it's important to understand the dynamics of these small amplitude oscillations in order to predict the interspike. So this is where now my uh, random point carré map uh, is useful. So here's a, a cartoon of, uh, of my face plane. So I've plotted the null lines in blue and I, I will take here my, so as, as Poincaré section, I will take this lower part here, sigma of, uh, of the, one of the null lines. So you see the point P and what happens is that starting somewhere up here, I hit my section at point, uh, the point X naught and say I, I make one uh, turn around P, then I hit sigma again at, at X1. And, and then let's assume I leave this domain D. So the domain D, uh, its shape is not very important, but it should contain a neighborhood of P and of the separate tricks in such a way that if I leave D, uh, I can say that uh, with large probability I, I will stop. And now what I'm interested in is the, the number of small oscillations, which is related to uh, the number of times I cross sigma before leaving D. So let's say uh, this number is capital N. So here N will be the number of, uh, of small oscillations. And to describe this as a, as a Markov process, actually uh, it makes sense to consider the process which is killed when leaving D. So what, what this means is that, let's assume I, I start on sigma, so different things can happen. So I, I can, uh, 
I can return to sigma without leaving V and then I increment my, my time step, my discrete time. Or I can uh, actually leave V without or before returning to sigma. And in that case, I just declare that my process goes to a cemetery state where it, uh, it stays forever. So what this means is that, that now I have, uh, I still have uh, a kernel K, K of XY. But now if I integrate K of XY over Y and sigma, this will be uh, in general strictly smaller than one because this integral, that's the probability of uh, not being K. And there's a positive probability of leaving V so of being K. And also if, if I iterate my, my kernel, so the integral of over sigma of Kn, so Kn would be the so I integrate n times k against itself. So this is nothing but the probability starting in x that at time uh, lowercase n, I'm still, uh, I haven't been killed, which is the same as saying that capital N is strictly larger than uh, lowercase n. All right, so, uh, what I can do now is uh, I can use uh, some uh, <clears throat> properties of these, uh, so of, of this uh, map K, this linear map K, which maps a probability distribution to another one. And one important uh, concept in this context is the Perron Frobenius theorem. And this theorem, uh, okay, it's maybe the best known for matrices, but it works for any linear operator. And it, it tells us that if I have a, a positive op linear operator K, so positive means that it maps a positive function to a positive function, under some mild uh, regularity assumption, it always has a real, maximum, maximal eigenvalue. Let's call it lambda naught. And actually, since I have a stochastic process, lambda naught can never be larger than one. So it is strictly between zero and uh, okay, possibly equal to one. So this is called a principal eigenvalue. And also, if I have an eigenvalue, I have uh, eigenfunctions and actually I have the left and right eigenfunctions because I can have the kernel act on the left or on the right by integrating against X or Y. So the associated eigenfunctions can always be taken real and positive. taking real and strictly positive. So it's not an obvious thing. So my, my maximal eigenvalue is real. And then I can always take the, the eigenfunction uh, real and positive. So what this means is that if I look at this equation, pi naught k is equal to lambda naught pi naught, then, so this is the same, of course, then integral over sigma pi naught of x, k of x, y, dx is equal to lambda naught pi naught of y. Then, uh, so this means uh, that, uh, so pi naught is my left eigenfunction. Let me normalize it in such a way that the integral is equal to one. And in particular, if X naught, if my initial distribution is uh, 
is equal to pi naught. So my initial condition is distributed according to, uh, to, this, uh, to this pi naught, which is a probability distribution with this normalization. Then you see that by iterating this xn, you have distribution lambda naught to the n times pi naught. And <clears throat> this means that if I integrate this distribution over sigma, the integral of pi naught is one, so I will get lambda naught to the n. So, so this means that the probability, if I start with pi naught, that n is larger than lowercase n, so I'm still alive, the process is still alive at time n, is given exactly by lambda naught to the n. So this, this pi naught uh, <coughs> is important, so it's called a quasi-stationary distribution. And it occurs in a, in a lot of, uh, of stochastic systems and also in statistical physics. And let me uh, write QSD for quasi-stationary distribution. So it means that it's invariant and it also has uh, the, proper, the property that uh, the distribution of Xn uh, conditioned on the fact that uh, you have survived is given by this pi naught, right? So if you think of it as simulating the process with a, a rejection method and you only keep the trajectories that survive, then these trajectories will always have this distribution why not. And it, it follows from, uh, from this expression that just for making a, a difference, I can compute the probability that capital N is equal to lowercase n and it's equal to lambda naught to the n times one minus lambda naught, which means that it's a geometric and invariant. So you see that this quasi-stationary distribution has the, pro the property that if you start with a distribution, the number of small oscillations, the uh, survival time, has a geometric distribution with parameter one minus lambda naught. All right, so uh, here's a, a theorem that generalizes just a little bit what I've just said to more general initial distributions, which could be in a, in a deterministic point. So that's a result I obtained with Damien Landon a few years ago. So assuming that there is noise in the system, I will always have uh, my principal eigenvalue, which is strictly smaller than one. And for any initial distribution mu naught, I have the following property. So the probability that if I have, so, so given that I've survived until time n, the probability that I will be killed at the next iteration converges to one minus lambda naught. So this is, uh, this we call asymptotically geometric and uh, the terminology is actually due to uh, Hitchenko and Medvedev. So if the distribution of N were exactly geometric, this relation would be true without taking a limit. But in general, if you start with a different initial condition uh, than pi naught, it will only be true uh, asymptotically. And the idea for obtaining this is that you have to show that you have a spectral gap in your linear operator K. Can I ask a question here, please? Yes, of course. Um, so you can imagine a lot of systems where there's some deterministic aspects that on each return you get closer and closer to the boundary so that you don't get this geometric distribution. So what, what assumption would be broken in such cases? Uh, I'm there not are a lot of oscillators where you know, the period may be more Gaussian about some mean, um, you know, some sort of escape system. Okay, so so you you're saying the deterministic dynamics makes you uh, leave uh, the domain? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. So say you, you have like an unstable focus, and yes. I go round a few times. There's noise, but you're not going to get a geometric distribution for first passage times out of that area. Um, yeah, well, what, what this result, yeah, what the result says is that 
uh, actually it will still be asymptotically geometric, but the decay will be extremely fast. So, so you, you will not, it will be a rare event to stay for a long time and to see this, uh, this convergence, you have to wait for a long time. Okay, I see. Thanks. So, so uh, <clears throat> maybe it will become clearer if I, I show you some, some simulations on the next slide. So here are some histograms of distributions of, of this number of small oscillations. So what we have done is that for, so noise and time scale separations are fixed and uh, we gradually decrease the bifurcation parameter. So we come closer and closer to uh, the bifurcation. Actually, in the last case, we are on the other side of the bifurcation point. And, and you see uh, that, so in each case, we had like 1,000 spikes. And between spikes, there can be a lot of small oscillations. And you see that, you can see this uh, the geometric decay over several orders of magnitude. So in the first case, you have uh, on the average a thousand small oscillations and like, then, then it's more like a hundred and ten oscillations in, in average. And in the last case, you get uh, very uh, skewed towards n equals one, n equals one meaning that we escape right away. So uh, that's, I think, the, the question you asked Paul. So, so you see here, you, you have something which is extremely, uh, uh, skewed towards n equals one, but you still have this uh, geometric decay here, except that uh, the probability of seeing this becomes extremely small. Okay, so, so this is a first uh, qualitative result, but we would like actually to be more uh, quantitative if possible, and here's a more quantitative result. So it has uh, the following. So assuming that uh, epsilon is uh, sufficiently small and delta is sufficiently small compared to uh, square root of epsilon. And uh, so remember delta smaller than square root epsilon means I have a focus. So I, I have to be uh, really, uh, I mean, far away from the boundary where the P is no longer a focus. And then there's this condition on the noise intensity, which has to be smaller than this particular function of epsilon and delta, where you can forget about the, the logarithm, it's not very important. Then uh, one minus the principal eigenvalue is uh, exponentially small as a function of these parameters. And as a consequence, the expected number of small oscillations is exponentially large. So just to give you an idea how you can get this kind of, of result. So the first thing is that we go to a new coordinate. So we started with coordinates at x, y. And, and we go to some new coordinates, uh, which are called xi and z. So here on the picture, I have xi here and z here. So this is achieved by translating to p, doing some scaling, so zooming in on what happens near p, and then uh, doing some nonlinear quadratic transformation to straighten out the, the separatrix. So the, the separatrix is uh, this. Uh, this this red line here on, on the picture. And in these new coordinates, the system looks uh, more or less like this. So I have d xi t is equal to one minus z t dt plus a noise term with a, with a rescaled intensity and uh, d z t is equal to some parameter eta plus psi t z t z t plus also some uh, rescaled noise term here. And so this, this eta is uh, it's equal to delta over square root of epsilon minus sigma one tilde square. And this minus sigma one tilde square Square is an Ito Stratonovich correction. So if you know SDEs, you know that. 
these, uh, these corrections when you have nonlinear changes of variables. And sigma tilde i is simply sigma i divided by epsilon to the three quarters. Now, what I show in the picture, the, the blue lines, uh, these are solutions of the system when there's, there's no noise and this parameter eta is equal to zero. So that, that's a well-known result for Fitzhugh Bruno through, I think, to Ernu and, and Mandel in the 90s, that the system becomes integral. You have a, a first integral in this limit. And you see what happens to my system. When I start here, I more or less follow these, these curves, but I, depending on the, var the value of eta, I can drift more to the, uh, my point P, which is here, or I can drift uh, to the separate tricks and cross the, the separate tricks. Now, uh, what, so our sigma, our Poincaré section is like this here, sigma. And the idea to, to get a bound on the principal eigenvalue is to introduce a subset here, A of sigma well-chosen subset A. And just uh, let me write my, my equation here, uh, my uh, eigenvalue equation. So lambda naught times pi naught of A will be equal to, uh, so that's pi naught K of A, which is bounded below by the integral over A of pi naught of X, K of X A, dx. And this I can bound below by pi naught of a times the, the infimum over x and a of this k of x a. So if now I simplify by pi naught of a, if pi naught of a is non-zero, I get a lower bound lambda naught is larger than this infimum x and a k of x So it means that if I can construct my set A in such a way that wherever in A I start, it's very likely that I return to A, then this uh, infimum gives me a lower bound on lambda naught, so an upper bound of one minus lambda naught. So that's basically what we do. Then of course you have to analyze the, uh, the dynamics uh, uh, in a precise way, but the idea is that you just have actually to uh, compute a probability with this uh, k of xa. All right, so, so that's a theorem. Now, we would also at least like to know what happens for, for stronger noise. So, and as you can see on, on the picture here on, uh, on the top right, you see that so I have two realizations with uh, weaker and stronger noise. And for stronger noise, actually, I, I, I drift to, uh, to the negative Z regions, which this corresponds to a spike. And I don't have a theorem here, but uh, we have some uh, qualitative understanding. So the idea is I, I take again my, my equation I've shown before, but I approximated by a simpler equation, which is the, the following one. So maybe I'll just show the equation again. So if I'm close to the, to the separate tricks, it means that Z is small and uh, D Xi T is close to one. So Xi T is close to T. And then I plug this into the second equation. And what, what I get then is, uh, is a, much simpler equation like this. So which is a linear equation. And since this equation is linear, I can solve it. And the solution I, I can write in the following form. So ZT is the initial condition plus some exponential uh, mean. So it will be Gaussian with, a, with this mean and, and some uh, standard deviation. And here I will have a, a normal random variable of mean zero and a 
and balance one. And uh, okay, that's that's approximate. And then the the probability that n equals one, which is the probability that I spike immediately, will be given by uh, well, approximately by the limit when t goes to infinity of the probability that zt is negative, right? Because, okay, if for large time zt is negative, then I uh, think that it is uh, very likely that I will start. And, and this I can rewrite in terms of the probability that my normal, standard normal random variable is smaller than minus eta over uh, sigma to tilde. And uh, which which I can, can compute. So in, I mean, it, this is given in terms of the distribution function of the normal distribution. And, and this is exactly what is shown on the blue curve here. So here we have done simulations with uh, different values of these parameters, which are, okay, so, so this is eta over sigma here. And uh, we go from a regime on the left where it's very unlikely to spike to a regime on the right where it's very likely to spike. And, and, the, and the stars here, the red stars are uh, exactly this uh, probability here that I spike right away. Uh, as we find it in the simulation, and you see there's a good agreement. Now, one observation is that if I were to start in uh, my QSD, then actually I, I would have the following. So the probability starting in the QSD that n equals one, uh, that's exactly one minus lambda naught because it's this geometric distribution and it's also one over the expectation of n. And the simulation here, is, so the, the circles show one minus lambda naught. So here the circles, uh, an estimate, a numerical estimate of one minus lambda naught and the, the crosses, the pluses, are a uh, numerical estimate of one over the expectation of n. Okay, so you see it's not quite the same, uh, and that's because we, after spike, we do not arrive exactly in the quasi-stationary distribution. So there's a certain deviation that, that you see in this picture. <clears throat> All right, so, so let me just summarize what, uh, what we have seen in, uh, in this example. So uh, if I start with, uh, uh, so I've mainly uh, talked about this regime one. So that was my first theorem here, which said that uh, if, so in my parameter space, delta sigma for, for fixed epsilon, I'm in this region one down here. Then I have rare isolated spikes like in, in this picture here. And I, I have an estimate on the expectation of the time between spikes. And I know that uh, the distribution of this time or the number of small oscillations is uh, close to a geometric distribution. And now what I just told you, when I increase the noise intensity, I have a transition. So, so there's an article by Muratov and Van den Eilden where by formal computations, they analyzed quite a lot of different regimes. And they, they said, okay, there are clusters of spikes. Actually, what we see here, it's, it's maybe not really right to speak of clusters of spikes, but what happens is that the the, the parameter of my asymptotically geometric interspike interval, uh, which was very small for in regime one, becomes of order one. And in particular, on, on this curve here, sigma equals square root delta epsilon, it's equal to one half. 
And when you increase still the noise intensity, it becomes very likely to spike, as I showed you on, on the previous graph, and then you're actually spiking all the time. And you don't really see anything dramatic anymore. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure about time. Do I still have like 15 minutes or it's up to you since we lost some time? Yeah, I'm, 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 I can stay maybe if people have to go now, they're welcome to leave, but I'm happy to keep listening to, I mean, that's very interesting. Okay, so. Mm. So, so, so this was my main application I wanted to discuss in detail. And uh, I think the, the uh, important thing that this application shows is that uh, there, there are two things. This notion of random Poincaré maps gives you uh, some, some idea about qualitative things like this uh, existence of this uh, principal eigenvalue. And, and then, of course, you want to get to more quantitative information, which means that, that you have really to estimate things. So, and, and then, of course, it's a lot more work. And, uh, but you see, there are these two steps. First of all, the random Poincaré map gives you some way of thinking about the system. And, and then, uh, of course, you have to do computations if you want uh, quantitative results, and, uh, and you have to uh, to work harder to get them, but you can do it, at least in, in some cases. So uh, let me return to a general equation like this, and it's the same picture as before. So I have two stable periodic orbits, say gamma one, gamma two. Let's say they are separated by an unstable orbit. And, and one question I want to ask is, can I uh, describe the system with noise by an effective Markov chain? Because what you kind of expect is that on some coarse-grained large scale, uh, on a coarse-grained large scale, you will have kind of something like a Markov chain or Markov jump process between these two orbits. Because what, what happens if you do simulation is you, let's say, say we start in X naught and then we converge first to gamma one. But if we wait long enough, we will go to the orbit gamma two, we will follow it for a long time, and then we will go back to, uh, to gamma one. Or what, what happens if I have more than, than two periodic orbits? And there's of course room for a lot of things to do to, uh, to tackle this problem. Uh, so, so one thing I, I want to outline, which, uh, which I did with uh, one of my students is uh, a spectral decomposition. So of course, only one possibility among many to describe these systems, but what is it? So assume I, I can say something about the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of my, uh, my kernel K. And remember, I, I can look at left and right eigenfunctions. Uh, depending on whether I integrate with respect to, to X or Y. Since my operator K, which is a compact linear operator has uh, nice properties, I, I know that it, it will have actually eigenvalues and uh, the eigenvalues can only accum accumulate at zero. That's a property of compact operators. And let me uh, assume that I normalize things in such a way that the inner product between pi i and pi j is a Kronecker delta i j. Uh, why is this useful? If, if I know this decomposition, it's, it's a result of spectral theory that I can write my kernel k of x, y as, as a sum of projectors onto eigenspaces times eigenvalues. So it's something like this. Okay, you might have to use uh, Jordan blocks if you have multiple eigenvalues, but if it's not the case, then uh, you have a decomposition like this. 
Okay, actually, if I don't kill my process, lambda naught is equal to one, and then phi naught is also constant equal to one. Now, why is, is this useful? Because if now I iterate my kernel, well, I will simply take powers of, of the eigenvalues here. So if, if I know something about the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, I'm able, I, I get information about my kernel here. So we, we worked on finding some information on, on these uh, eigenvalues. So, so the idea is actually that if capital N is the number of stable periodic orbits, only capital N eigenvalues will be close to one and the others will be bounded away from one and will be less important. So I need a few assumptions. So let me assume, uh, I will be a bit vague here, but let me assume that I have confining dynamics, meaning that my, first of all, the ODE has some attracting set and also the, the noise term is, uh, is not too bad. Let me assume that the noise is elliptic and that means that the noise goes in all directions. So my matrix G times it's transpose as a symmetric matrix is, uh, is positive definite. Uh, let me assume that I have finitely many limit sets and that's for the deterministic dynamics and there are only n stable limit sets, which are n stable periodic orbits. And there's a fourth condition, which uh, I'm going to explain uh, just a little bit later, which is uh, what is called a metastable hierarchy of the uh, periodic orbits. Right, so, <clears throat> Under this type of conditions, uh, here's the result we, we get. So the n largest eigenvalues of k are real and positive, which is not obvious that they are real in particular. And they are given by the following expressions here. So lambda naught is one and the n minus one next eigenvalues uh, are given by these very precise expressions. So, and they're actually close to one and uh, all subsequent eigenvalues are smaller. So they are bounded away from one. So uh, just to explain the notation, so assume uh, this, these are my periodic orbits, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. So that this is my section sigma. So I put neighborhoods B1, B2, B3 around these orbits on, on the section. So uh, this phi naught k plus one, uh, it's some quasi-stationary distribution of the process killed when it hits uh, the set, uh, the union of B1 to Bk. And so tau plus B, that's the, the return time, so it's the smallest time such that Xn is in B, but starting in one. And this probability here, so this thing here, you can show that it behaves like exponential minus some Hk over sigma squared. So it's so these uh, probabilities are all exponentially small in sigma. And they are given in terms of uh, Fredlin Wenzel theory. So let me just briefly describe this, uh, what is Fredlin Wenzel theory. So I again have my, my stochastic differential equation and given a trajectory, so gamma here is a function from zero t to Rn, so uh, sorry. 
So this, this gamma is, is some, some deterministic path. So, so, so it goes from zero T to Rn. And this, this I, this integral uh, will be always non-negative and it's, uh, it's zero only if gamma is a solution of the deterministic system. So, so this I gives me, uh, roughly speaking, the probability of uh, the, the stochastic system tracking this particular uh, deterministic uh, trajectory. So the probability of tracking the trajectory decays like exponential minus this integral I over sigma squared. And then you have a notion of quasi-potential between periodic orbits. So this would be, you look at all trajectories connecting the orbits gamma i and gamma j and arbitrary time capital T. And you look at the weight function of this connection and you take the minimum over all possible trajectories. So that's called the, the quasi-potential. And my fourth assumption on metastable hierarchy has to do with ordering the periodic orbits in a correct way, and they are ordered from most stable to least stable. And okay, this here's the, the definition of this ordering, which is maybe not so easy to understand, but uh, it's easier to explain if I have a, uh, so it's an analogy. If I look at uh, at a gradient system. So if, if I look at uh, a gradient equation, dxt is minus nabla v of xt plus, uh, so dt plus sigma dwt. Uh, then these h i j's are, are barrier heights. Huh? So h of i j will be the potential barrier height between i and j. And the way you find this hierarchy is the following. So you look for each uh, local minimum of the potential at the, the easiest way to exit the potential way. So you can draw it like this, like this, like this, and like this. And then I look from, from which potential minimum it's easiest to escape. And I see it's, it's this one, so that would be my orbit gamma four. And then I see the, the next one is this gamma three here. And, and then uh, <clears throat> I start over again, but ignoring gamma four and gamma three. So what I have to do is I, I have to look how hard it is to escape from the remaining potential wells. And I see it's given by these heights here. And then I get gamma two here because it's easier to escape from gamma two and gamma one will be the one here. And for each of these escapes, I get a height. So this height here would be H4, which so H4 would be the same as H of four one. Then here I get H3, which is also H from three to two. And here I get H2, and H1 would be, uh, would be infinite, actually. So here are my HKs, and these HKs give me the, the probabilities I've, I've written here. So the, the probability starting in some distribution near the k plus first periodic orbit to hit the k orbits below before returning to this orbit. So to be true, the orbits have to be put in the, in the right order. And, and the consequence of this theorem is that, you see, in terms of, of uh, eigenvalues, I have, so I have a unit circle here. So I have my eigenvalue one, which is lambda naught. And then I have a certain number of eigenvalues which are exponentially close to one. So there are n 
or n minus one of these eigenvalues, and all subsequent eigenvalues are uh, bounded away from the, from the boundary of the circle. So they are somewhere in, in this disk here. And this means that my kn of xy, my n-fold iterative kernel, can be approximated for a large n by the finite sum. So I only go from k goes from 1 to n minus 1, lambda k to the n, by k of x, by k of y. And here the observation is, uh, it's ac actually as really the same expression as what you would get for an n state Markov chain on uh, the n neighborhoods d1 to dn. And in particular, what you can also show is that wherever you start in the ball dk plus one, the expectation the expected first hitting time of the orbits, uh, I mean, the neighborhoods below in the hierarchy will be very close to one over one minus lambda k, which is also given by this exponential. So some constant over sigma squared. So, so this is also approximately expectation HK over sigma squared. All right, so, so that's what my uh, result says. We have these capital N eigenvalues which are close to one. And in some sense, it says that my, my process can be approximated at least on the level of this decomposition and eigenfunctions by uh, an end state Markov chain and the end states are the the n uh, periodic orbits or neighborhoods of these n periodic orbits. Okay, so I I think my time is over, so I, I won't say more on uh, on other directions of research. So maybe I will just uh, end with a few references. Of course, we can discuss afterwards if people are interested. So the first two references are uh, the two works I, I mainly talked about. Here are a few other uh, works where we also used uh, this uh, concept of random Poincaré map in, uh, so for other problems. And, and the last work here is a recent work where I tried to obtain better approximations than these uh, fredin wenzel exponential approximations to, uh, for these transition times. And I think uh, <clears throat> it's time to stop. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much for such a nice talk. Um, so please feel free to ask questions if you have any. Sure, perhaps I can go with a, with one about um, your, your effective potential um, representing the transitions between orbits. You showed it as kind of one dimension um, in a particular order. So I'm, I'm getting feedback. I don't know if everyone else is. Yes, but I, I think I, so my, my picture of the potential is, uh, is one dimensional, but uh, of course, uh, in general, you, you will have uh, something uh, of higher dimension. So okay. I just made yeah. this one dimensional picture because it's easier to see. Uh, okay, so, so you don't general, require a transition, say, from one to two to always have to go via three, for example. It can be in any. Yeah, right. Any order. Yeah, in, in general, it's it's possible. You you can have level sets like I, I don't know. You have a saddle here, and here you have one local minimum and another one, and these can be, uh, you know, in a, you have a, a higher saddle here, and, uh, and okay, you you can have all kinds of configurations with uh, where it's also possible to go around. So you, it could be in higher dimension, be possible to go from uh, uh, gamma four to, uh, I don't know, from gamma two to gamma four with, uh, without uh, crossing gamma three, that, that's correct. So. Okay, got it, thanks. Yeah, uh, but, but one thing is that for gradient systems, you can really, you have this global potential, but in general for non-gradient systems, 
the quasi potential is a bit more difficult. It's in general not globally defined. So yeah, like an Escher staircase, right? Uh, say again. Like an Escher staircase. Yes. You keep going downhill, but can end up back where yeah, you. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's that's a good analogy. Yes. So Niels, I had a, <clears throat> I had, I think a quite open question regarding that. So recently we've been, I mean, I've been working on this question of, you know, noise induced oscillations in, in mean field systems. So now the, the differential equation is not really an SD, a Markovian equation. It's a, it's a Mackin, it's a mean field equation. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and there is this kind of, when you increase noise and it's not small noise, you get synchronization and you have like a, a sort of random uh, periodic orbit. So the, it, it's more periodic, I would say, than, than the perturbations of an excitable system because the probability distribution the, is not stationary, it's kind of periodic. And, and the fredlin wenzel theory doesn't really work at, the, at these levels of, uh, of noise because it's not small noise. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you thought um, this kind of ideas, I mean, whether these kind of ideas on Poincaré, random Poincaré maps could apply to these, uh, I mean, non -Mark let's say non-Markovian, they are, I'm not really non marco I mean, they are non-Markovian because the future does not only depend on the initial condition, but the, the, in the you can still write a differential equation on the probability distribution, right? But it's not, uh, it's non-local. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you thought these, these kind of ideas could apply and if that would allow to show the existence and stability of periodic orbits in collective systems. Uh, like in large scale uh, networks. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, the thing is, I I use the Markov property quite a lot. Then, of course, if if your system is not Markovian, but if you go to a maybe large enough space, yeah. it will still it will again be Markovian. So you can work mm -hmm. with that. But it's maybe you don't want to do that. So yeah. Uh, you know, this system, it's not that they depend on the past, it's that they are coupled to the probability distribution. Uh, okay, so instead yeah, of the okay. mm -hmm. differential equation, you have the expectation of the function of the solution on the, oh, on the okay. right, right hand side. Yeah, I, so I see what you mean. Yeah. It's not completely non Markovian in the sense that you depend on the past, but you depend on the low. Yes. Uh, Okay, I haven't really been working on that, but I know people who have. So maybe you know works by people like Jean Battista Jacomin and then Bastien Fernandez and so on. They, uh, Eric Luisson, uh, Christophe Croquet. So yeah, they they have, but but they uh, have not really. Uh, they have thought more about phase dynamics. I think so. How the phase is synchronized. So. Uh, I, I would say these are kind of they are a little bit complementary approaches where you one thing is to look at the phase dynamics, which is important for synchronization, and the other is to look at the radial dynamics, which is uh, I mean, do you converge to a periodic orbit and, and so on. But uh, actually, we uh, I mean we have a common uh, research project, so we that's kind of something we we uh, we want to uh, to think about that in in the future. Uh, then in another direction, uh, with the current PhD students, we're looking at stochastic PDEs, which are perturbed periodically. And we also think that some, some of these ideas are applicable there, but we are only really in the very first uh, stages of doing that. Okay. Do we have any more questions for Niels? 
All right, so I guess we will just wrap up here for today. Um, I'd like to thank our speaker names again and everyone for your patience uh, for the Zoom bombing accident and also participating. Um, so next week, our speaker will be Paul Miller, who's already here. Um, and I will hope to see you guys um, next week. Thank you for a good talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.